the biggest thing with cutting tools and any kind of cutting tool, whether it's indexable, solid, round, ream, or drill, hole, anything, there are a lot of issues that you have at the spindle that are byproducts of something else. It's Hey everyone, welcome to Machine Shop Tech Talk. I'm here today with Don Grant, Cutting Tool Counselor over at Harvey Tool. Now you might recognize this man from everything he does with In The Loop TV and Don, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for joining me, man. Hey, no problem, Arthur. And you said Harvey Tool, but it's Harvey Performance because Harvey oh. Performance has one of the brands of Harvey Tool, Helical <laughs> Solutions, Titan USA, Micro 100, yeah. Core Hog, and now of course I'm wearing the shirt, uh, Valor, which is our new hole making yeah. brand. So uh, yeah, it's it's Harvey Performance, but one of our largest brands is Harvey Tool, which is why a lot of people yeah. are very familiar with that brand. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Don. I know I, I mix them up sometimes. I'll go I'll type in Harvey Tool when I'm looking for the Harvey Performance webpage. So <laughs> <laughs> and and the funny thing is, if you get to Harvey Performance, it has all the brands. So you can really dial yeah. you can really dial down to what brand you're looking for, and yeah. each one of the brands has something a little bit different to offer, which I love being an application engineer. And, and thanks for having me, Arthur. And I appreciate your time to kind of talk about a few things when it comes to cutting tools, because uh, anybody that watches my in the loop, I'm not short of conversation. And you can tell me to shut up anytime you want and I'll be I'll be okay with that. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that, man. So for the audience today, we're, what, we're not here to tell you about the new best end mill or the new best reamer, or the new best drill. We're here to look at a different side of the conversation I think often gets missed. Don and I were talking, you know, it's the first thing we ask, oh, hey, I want to try this new end mill. Okay, great. What are you putting it in? So we're going to talk about tool holding, work holding, programming strategies, and other things to consider before you just go, oh, I want to try the new shiny end mill. I want to try the new drill. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. As we were talking before, Arthur, the, the biggest thing with cutting tools and any kind of cutting tool, whether it's indexable, solid, round, ream, or drill, hole, anything there are a lot of issues that you have at the spindle that are byproducts of something else <laughs> right the, the cutting tool is the first thing to be blamed but quite often yeah. the the last thing that's causing the majority of your issues not all the time but we see that in the field so many times that we have to be a, a cutting tool private investigator to figure out yeah. everything that's happened to reduce the chatter, to not get the tool to break, uh, to get it to function right, and to, and to save the, the money at the spindle by using the tool the correct way. Because I come from the, the shop floor as a machinist, I never, like when I got into distributor sales just over eight years ago with Thomas Skinner, it was something I never considered. Someone's like, oh, I wanna try a new end mill. I had all of these assumptions. Oh, they're gonna hold it right, they're gonna program it right, you know, they're gonna hold their parts securely. I had all these assumptions as like the machinist I was coming into this. And what I learned is someone wants to test an end mill or a drill, whatever the cutting tool is. It, it even applies on lathes as well, not just to mills, yeah, but agree. they, they want to try a new tool. And it's like, okay, my first question is, how are you going to hold this? 100%. And, and uh, you, you kind of lead into the story I like to tell all the time because I'm a national application engineer for Harvey Performance, of course. So I'm going in to do applications. Now, what I love is when a customer will call me and say, hey, your tool's failing. It's breaking. And so you start asking a series of questions, can't figure it out. So you go in because I want to help the customer. I go in with the application where the tool is breaking, look at the table yeah. and there's my tool and four competitor tools and they're all failing, right? So it's, so the, the, the thing in my head being an application engineer, it's like, okay, you're not having a cutting tool problem. You're having an application problem. And so where you sometimes find a cutting tool, like maybe you try five different cutting tools and one works. It's not solving the problem, it's masking the problem. You know what I mean? That one cutting tool just might have a different geometry that's getting through that issue, whether it be deflection or a fixture, might be cutting a little bit freer, or maybe the fluke count in the helix is causing things. So what I see all the time, and which is why I'm an application engineer, is are we having a cutting tool problem or are we having an application problem? And when you get to application problems, oh my gosh, we could talk about the machine. We could talk about the spindle. We can talk about the fixture. We can talk about the programming. We can talk about the tool path. We can talk about the holder and those things that you mentioned. So really when we show up as experts in our field, 
you included as yeah. dis d distributor metal cutting is we really don't want to just throw tools and see what sticks. We want to find out what's causing that problem with that tool so we can permanently fix that situation. Oh, exactly. And I think that's a good place to start on. Maybe if we kind of just break down the different areas we're looking. I know I already mentioned the, the tool holding. Maybe we can start there and then we can branch out from that. For me, I like to see something really rigid, especially in an end mill application, because just the effects that run out have on a tool and especially with the new geometries and the new grades and everything else. I mean, if your runout's bad, usually you slow it down, which then you're not getting enough temperature to activate the coating on the tools if it's a coated tool. You're also not going to be programming it optimally now because you're trying to take it easy. And the moment people start to try to take it easy with a new cutting tool is usually when that tool fails. And then, you know, I've had guys and I've put it in an end mill and they're like, oh, it's no good. I went back to the M42 cobalt high speed steel end mill I was running and that works just fine. So I'm going to stick with that. But the M42 cobalt with the 8% has a really good resilience to issues with vibration and improper programming and stress loading the tool because it's got well, way more flex than a carbide yeah. tool. Yeah. So they're trying to put in a carbide. They've got the part held poorly. They're holding the tool in a collet that they haven't replaced for like 10 years and it's all worn out. They haven't checked the run out on the tool. Mm -hmm. So the M42 Cobalt doesn't care. Yeah. It's, it's going to run at that 80 to 100 SFM for life in mild steel and not complain. But you throw in a carbide that's meant to be a high performance tool, you know, running at 400 plus SFM, you're going to run into some difficulties. So I think there's just shops out there that they try the new tool. They're like, oh, it failed. They throw it out. And they're like, I'm going to stick with what's always worked. And that's fine. But what's always worked is not going to let them be competitive. Yeah. And the guys that are willing to look at this and look at how they hold their tools are going to be the ones that succeed. Yeah. Yeah. And you bring up a good point with the tool holder. And let's start with the tool holder. So when you're looking at picking or selecting a tool holder, okay, the biggest thing and the question that we ask, and I'm kind of going to give this a little bit for, more for the perspective of the, the things I do, right, is the biggest question, well, what are you doing with the tool? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you finishing? Are you roughing? Are you going to hog? Are you going to take a big step over? Are you doing a high efficiency tool path? Are you going to plunge with that? Is this a drilling application? What are you doing with that tool? Because now mm -hmm. you can get away with certain holders if you're doing something a little bit different, right? Then we start looking at, well, what's the gripping force of that holder, right? What's the run out of that holder? Is it a Cat 40 holder? Is it an HSK holder? How is it gonna hold? So those things, when it comes to the holder, without diving into specifics, because we sell cutting tools, but believe it or not, if I don't yeah. understand what the holder does, I'm gonna have a hard time fixing the situations with the cutting tools. So it's very important, number one, what are you doing with the tool and what holder yeah. are you using? Side lock. Let's talk about side lock really quick. Side lock holders. Now you might think that a high performance cutting tool company such as myself are going to wave my finger at you and say, do not use side lock holders. <laughs> I love side lock holders. I love them in the right situation. They're very rigid. They're not going to pull out. If you don't want to spend the money on a safe lock or something else, a side lock holder, if you're hogging, if you're roughing, if you're doing those type of things and it's a large enough diameter tool, the runout's not going to hurt you that much. A side lock holder might be a good choice. So those type of things are now that I just said side lock. I mean, when you come to ERs, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a big fan of ER. <laughs> College systems for high performance cutting tools. I've never been, but I do understand where they're used, but that's kind of a little bit more of the lower scale on a high performance cutting tool is, is, is the ER. It really depends on what do you want to do with that tool? And then we can talk about what holder you have. So it's not, it's not a matter of, you know, looking at your customer and just going, you need to buy all new holders, right? Which is what some of these conversations some yeah. of our customers go, oh, what? They're just trying to sell us a bunch of holders. No, what, what are you trying to do? And what we want to do is maximize your time with that holder and, and make sure it works yeah. well. 
Well, and make sure that there's alignment between what we're recommending and actually getting them to a solution. Yeah. I've had situations where they're like, well, this is how I'm going to hold it. This is how I'm going going to finish it. They're, you know, they wanted to throw it into an ER, call it truck. They wanted to hog heavy, like 75, 80% step over, all this other stuff. And I'm like, dude, just keep using the tool you're using. Yeah. 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 If you just want to tackle it that way, this tool is not, not meant for that, you know? So well, what do you mean? Well, it, this is more for like a 20% step over. This is meant for more like high feed engagement. So this just isn't the right tool. Yeah. And sometimes they're like, they get curious and they're like, okay, well, if I want to remove, you know, whatever their material removal goals are, what would you recommend? And then they kind of come and throw it back to us, right? And I'm sure you've had the same situation. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, well, look, if you're doing this and, you know, you're in a 40 taper, I'm going to recommend this. If they were in a 50 taper, like an HSK 100, I'd have a different recommendation. Yeah. And then you just break it down. Okay, this is the tool. You know, you want to do 10 to 20% step over. Yep, throw it into your CAD CAM software. You know, whether it's MasterCam or Gibbs or if you, whatever they're using. Use their high-speed path version. Okay, cool. Then they're willing to work with it. Yes. But have you ever had times, Don, where they're just determined to do it a certain way? They won't take anything, so you just absolutely get out of there? Or? Absolutely. See, now you said get out of there. Me, personally, I take that as a <laughs> challenge, Arthur. Right. Okay. That's a challenge. But but now we can manipulate the tool path to make the holder work. See, this is kind of like, yeah. what are you doing? Okay. So if you want to work with an ER collet, you're exactly right. So an ER collet, I'm going to tell you right now, doesn't have the gripping strength. So just a little insight for your your subscribers and your followers yeah. is now watch your helix angle on your M mill because the higher your mm -hmm. helix angle, the more that tool is going to want to pull out of that holder. And when you're in an ER collet, you want to stay away from your 45 degree, your 40 degree, your 50 degree helixes because it's going to act as a corkscrew and it's going to want to pull down. Now you can get away with those with side lock holders and better gripping force. But if you're in an ER, that thing's going to want to pull out of there. This is exactly what we're saying is make sure you get the right tool to accommodate your holder if you're not willing to change the holder, right? If, if you're yeah. not willing to look at a different holder. Now, I got an opinion on holders really quick. The cost that you're going to pay on a holder versus the issue you're going to have on a tool are minimal. Minimal. What I'm saying is you're going to get a good high performance holder for $260. I don't know what that is in Canadian, maybe $300. So the key with that holder is if you take care of it, it lasts you five years. That payback is immediate. Now, with a consumable, it breaks, you got to buy a new one, it breaks, you got to buy a new one. But if you take care of a holder, it's going to last you a while. So the investment in the right holder makes sense to, to somebody like myself. What we had mentioned there, it's like, we're not trying to sell people holders. We're not trying to convince them to spend more money. We're trying to get them to invest in something like you said. This holder is a five-year investment. You get the right holder you've got way better tool life. So you're going to spend less on your consumables. Yeah. You're going to get more out of them. Uh, like all of the good stuff climbs, your material removal rate, your machine uptime, everything else when you invest in the right holder gets everything else to improve. So we will actually cost ourselves money because we sell less cutting tools when you're using the right holder. Yes. Run out even a couple tenths will can lose you half of your tool life. And it just, that blows me away. Yeah. <laughs> I always say to my customers, like a, a actor or an actress doesn't win an Emmy without a good supporting cast, right? If you're in a really bad movie, it's hard to win a, an Emmy or something. It's kind of the same thing with cutting tools, right? If you don't have, if you don't have a great supporting cast around you, then the tool's not really going to shine very well. It's not going to stand out. So uh, especially when you're talking a $50 end mill, if you think about a $50 end mill, if you just save one end mill a week, $200 a month, do the math spread out to 10, 12 months. It paid for the holders in itself. So it, it is important to make sure your holder's in good shape. It's the right holder. It's recommended for what you're doing. And again, we're not, I mean, I'll, refer anybody to a holder company and say, hey, if you want the right, I mean, I can make a recommendation, but just like we're experts in our field, there, there's some really good experts out in the holder uh, realm that make some really good stuff. It, there is, and a lot of it comes to local support on stuff like that, especially if you wanna be able to test out tools to make sure, mm -hmm. which most of them are willing, like, look, here, here, here's the quote, get the PO ready, but you can test it first, 
only if it yes. does what we're saying, you know, then you pay. Otherwise, we'll take it back. Yep. You've tried it because they're committed to machine shops saving money and getting the job done right. Yep. So that kind of touches on the the holder side of things. We were talking about programming and where do we want to go next, Don? What what subject do you want to jump into next? Well, I think toolpath is the big thing. Toolpath has everything okay. to do with programming. So, you know, if we're if yeah. we're gonna jump into what I feel is one of the most important things to get the most out of your tool, it's the toolpath. Uh, let me let me start this conversation with I just had a conversation with somebody on the phone. I was in Utah and they called the AE and they had a problem. So I jumped in and it was funny because he watched my videos in the loop TV and he goes, wow, am I talking to the, in and I go, Hey, I have to make a living. I, it's, I don't just do videos. I'm out on the road. You know what I'm saying? Applying the tools yeah. and shooting videos on the weekend. So I actually like to get out there. So he was running Inconel 718, very hard material to rub. Mm -hmm. And so it was his first go on, on Inconel. And he says, listen, how, give me some insight. How do I compete with my competitors in this material? What's the biggest thing that's going to give me my best bang for the buck? And you know what I told him, Arthur? I said, okay. strategy, strategy. Mm -hmm. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, strategy is going to help you. What you need to do is figure out what the best strategy to remove your material. And this is generalized. I'm not even talking, you know, yeah. round tool. What's the best strategy to remove your material the quickest, get the longevity of your cutting tools and be able to compete. Now, that strategy can be helped and supported by guys like myself, by Thomas Skinner and yourself and, yeah. and, and bringing all those things to it. But what I mean strategy is that tool path. Do you want to plunge rough all that material out? Do you want to use an HEM high efficiency? Do you want to use an indexable tool? Do you want to use a solid round? What's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck? And I truly believe this is where tool path comes in and strategy is how you start beating your competition is by how can I do this, not by the norm, but use a different strategy. Yeah, I definitely think strategy matters and looking at the strategy for the different machine types too, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the times people will complain about machines and there's some that are infamously complained about. And it's like, look, if you're programming for a 30 taper, you're fine. But if you're trying to program for a 50 taper and put it in a 30 taper, you're going to have issues. Right. Same with 40 taper, HSK 63, 100, whatever, BT, whatever your spindle type is. If you're not considering the machine that you're on, if you're not considering the fixturing and how you're holding your material, yep. if you're not considering the material itself, you're not considering chip evacuation. I mean, I don't know how many times I've gone in to support someone because they're snapping end mills and they're in a deep cavity on a vertical without any chip removal. Yeah. And they're just recutting chips in stainless. It's like, well, guys, <laughs> what are you doing for chip evacuation? What's your plan? Do you have an, do you know, do you have a program stop in there to clean out the cavity? Do you have, you know, a high efficiency mill that's got all of the serrations to break those chips up so they wash out with coolant pressure? Yes. There's just so many things and programming strategy and material removal methods is a huge component of that. And you touched on something that's so simple that you said is just the difference between a vertical and a horizontal changes the yeah. strategy. Gravity is your friend on one, gravity is not your friend on the other. It's it's really, <laughs> you know, I've been doing this for 37 years now and it's it's some of those things I think just get overlooked by the people that are in it all day. I mean, a horizontal needs to be addressed with the cutting tools a lot differently than a vertical machine and the coolant flush, yeah. whether you have high pressure or not. So strategy tool path. And, and it sounds like we're walking down this tool path uh, kind of scenario right now is, is there are so many different tool paths within all these cam packages that can utilize so many different tools, different ways. They're so intelligent that understanding your cam software, in the sense that you understand how all the tool paths work and what they're calculating on and what they're based on can really give you an edge. It really can. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm starting to do a lot of five axis stuff now. Five axis is, is another, you know, another avenue to take what we used to do in a three axis world and now be able to do things in five axis. And, and it's almost like three axis on steroids, right? Now we're, yeah. now we're up here going, 
wow, I, I, here's a whole nother world that we're looking at now. Now I can tilt my tool. I can get the most out of my ball nose tools or even look at, you know, HMAP, which we call our circle segment, our high performance yeah. tools. How do I get the use out of that? Tool path, strategy are the big things. Understand your cam software, whatever it is, and utilize it to its fullest. Especially you touched on the circle segment cutters that you guys carry too, right? Mm -hmm. It's once you go five axis and you can start rotating everything to create those straights, even though you've got like that, that segmented cutter, mm -hmm. the material remover rate, especially you mentioned Inconel 718, yeah. you know, the super alloys, when you can spread out your wear, that's a huge game-changing strategy. I mean, ball nose were a staple for so long, but now that you have that different form, you can lay that part over and start skimming the wall. Now you've right. got that entire contact face of the tool is right there. And man, talk about getting competitive. And you're stepping down eight to one to get the same scale of height. That's a minimum yeah. eight to one, which means if you're stepping down 10 thou to get a scallop pipe, now I can step down 80 thou and get the same scallop yeah. pipe. So I, I'm doing some videos now on HMAF, our HMAF that'll be coming out soon on In The Loop TV. But the whole oh, awesome. thing and goal that I want to present to everybody is if you're not, if you're doing five axis and you're not looking at circle segment or HMAP cutters, if you're not looking at them, you, you better start because it's the next level for surfacing, you know, doesn't mean it works for everything. And that's why we're doing the videos on it, but, but it is next level surfacing. Well, I, I'm looking forward to those videos, yeah. Don, because I don't know all the different ways you can, those tools are still fairly new to me as well. Yeah. And I know there's factors. So hopefully you cover some of the factors yes. to consider. But you're right. If you're not starting with what you call them, H -map. H -map. they're they're helical multi-axis finishers. You. That's we have a lot of axis. There, there. thank so you. Helical multi-axis finishers. Circle segment was already thank stolen, you. Arthur. So yeah. we couldn't we couldn't <laughs> use circle segment. So you know we got H maps, multi-axis finishers. <laughs> Perfect. So with your your multi-axis finishers, but it's you know if you're not starting to look at those when you're on five axis to do it then you, you could be just wasting your time. Yeah. And it's one of the components that, you know, newer shops, and this really applies to all the areas, shops that I find that I've opened in the last few years are starting with everything we're talking about. Yeah. They're, they have yes. already looked into it. Software. They have already, yep. you know, they, they're looking at their, you know, their, their quick change fixturing. It's working with a startup, when we talk about quick change fixturing, they're like, oh, that makes sense, I'm in. Yeah. They don't have that whole sunken cost fallacy of the the traditional vices yep. that they've got lining their tables, you know. So they're they're like, oh, quick change, okay, boom, done. They'll invest, you know, several thousand into quick change because they see the value yep. of it. They'll get different holders for finishing, different holders for roughing. They invest in the different types that are available now. A, a lot of what we're talking about today is really, I'm hoping it reaches people that are in shops that have been established a while that might be a little stuck in their rut. Yeah. You know, they have these guys come into them. They're convinced we're all just trying to sell them junk to, to make a living. Yeah. And they don't understand that we just really want to keep help them keep their doors open, employing people, bringing more money to the economy in North America. You can't get a return on your money if you don't invest it. And no matter if it's stocks or whatever, if you don't invest in your business, you're not going to get a return. It's you know what I'm saying? It's the same with stocks. Same with anything else. If you don't invest it, you can't get that return. And this is kind of what we're talking about is this isn't a slam your fist down saying you got to buy the most expensive thing possible to get oh, it. Gosh, but what no. you need to do is you need to start looking at the things that will give you your biggest return on your investment. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you don't invest in bad stocks. You invest in the good ones, or at least you think. Apparently, I only invest in bad ones because I'm not doing so well <laughs> oh. on my stocks. But you know what I'm saying? If you make the right investments, educated yeah. with guys like yourself and people in the industry, then your return should be tenfold. Yeah. And I think that's a, it's like stocks, but it's also different because if you do proper research and you work with the people in your supply chain, like yourself as a cutting tool counselor th through Harvey Performance, then you get to know these people and it's a little safer investment. Usually we can work out the ROI on paper. Sure. I usually go conservative. I take like, okay, 10 months. I'm probably going to tell you it's 12 months ROI yeah. just in case 
because I know sometimes, you know, a wrench gets thrown in there. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's kind of like stocks, just a little safer, I think. Yeah, um, it is. That's it's probably, <laughs> it's a good analogy, but a bad one. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Stocks, stocks yeah. tend to, yeah, not give you the return as quick, right? <laughs> well, it it's a good analogy, but yeah, if stocks have an unpredictable outcome. And I find if you look at all the stuff we're talking about, you know, the tool selection, the how you're holding the tool, the machine you're putting it into, you look into the material you're working with, yeah. the tool path you're using, the machine it's on. If you look at all those variables, it's a pretty safe return yeah. versus stocks are a little harder to predict. I mean, there's some guys out there that seem to be able to predict them really well, yeah. but. Yeah, that's right. I think that might be a I'm little inside one. kind of thing, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not calling anybody out, you know? No, no, never. No, no. Well, it's not on my end. I can guarantee you that. I get much better return on cutting tools than I do on stock. Yeah. So there you go. So Toolpath has a lot to do with it. I'm not going to call out any uh, okay. CAM packages as far as that goes because there's a lot of really good ones. I uh, yeah. There is. You know, personally, I work with Mastercam. They're great. Yeah. Um, they have a lot of good five-axis stuff. Um, so little little shout out to them just because they support our company very well. Uh, they support yeah. us with help and everything else. But uh, there's a lot of good CAM packages out there that you can you can inquire. But understanding it. Yeah. Is, is the key, understanding how it works and not just get tied to one tool path. Very big. Yeah, and really getting to know your CAM package. You were talking earlier about all the different options. I sat down with someone from Gibbs CAM mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago because I, as a machinist, I always use MasterCAM. Yep. That's what I was trained on. But like the last time I touched MasterCAM, I think was like 10. Yeah. Like just the first time they went with the X nomenclature. Yeah. That was the last uh, time. 2024. Or 12. Now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're a couple of years since I was last touching cam regularly, but I was just going over all the different options that are now available in cam packages. And he was talking about the different packages, you know, for the high speed machining and what they call it and all these different things. I was like, man, yeah, just learning what's available could really uh, save a lot of time. Kind of everything we're talking about, right? It's a package, right? It's not just yeah. the cutting tool. You know, and that's a huge investment. If you look at a cutting tool, my cutting tool might cost you 70 bucks, depending on where you're at. A cam package might cost you 50K. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A machine tool is going to cost you 800K. I mean, there's a, yeah. there's a reason it costs that much, but you look at all these things that we put the investment in and then, you know, mm -hmm. we're breaking this $40 end mill and everybody's just looking at the end mill going, that end mill not working. Well, let's just make sure we got everything in the right spot here. I mean, I really like the way you illustrated that, talking about the value of everything that we yeah. put into it, because you're right. A lot of people get so bent out of shape about the cost of a drill or an end mill or a reamer or something or, a, you know, a dovetail cutter, whatever the yeah. cutting tool is. And they're like, oh, well, th this one's, you know, a dollar cheaper. Well, yeah. OK, how long? Like, don't get me wrong. You should always look for the tool that does what you want at a price that makes sense for the yep. product you're making. Agreed. Okay. If, if you can't make that product at a profitable margin, then you've either got to ask more money from your customer or you've got to look at your strategies, bring in someone like Don or whoever's in your supply chain that you can trust to work with to, you know, have, bring in those fresh eyes to look, whatever, whatever you're going to see then you can tackle it. Okay, cool. Oh, what if you did the operations a little bit differently? Do you have yeah. a horizontal? Let's put it on a horizontal. You got that deep cavity. Horizontal would just let your chips keep draining out. You know, whatever mm -hmm. the strategy is, if you can't make the part at a cost that makes sense, you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Fighting over the cost of an end mill by a dollar, the amount of time that people spend out of their daily life worrying about a dollar here a dollar there i'm not saying you shouldn't look at the overall picture but it should always be in my experience from quoting jobs to running them to working with customers now look we need to make this part for this much what can you do to help me to make yeah. it for that much and in the scheme of it what, what is the percentage of the, the the consumables versus the percentage of your labor your time, yeah. I always like to bring up time. Time's the biggest thing when you're looking at cutting tools because my job isn't to sell end mills, it's to sell time, really. Yes, I mean, exactly. especially with Harvey Performance. We're, we're not yeah. selling end mills. I, ha I have to, Arthur, I have to sell time. If I just went yeah. out and sold end mills, I wouldn't be very successful. 
I, we, no. You, right? It's time. So how do I get that customer an extra 20 hours on that machine a week, an extra 50 hours of their life back? You know what I'm saying? An extra shift of manufacturing? How do I get that time by putting the right tool in and make sure that tool is going to last in that spindle? So I don't know about you, but I can talk to myself. Time is the rarest commodity and the most valuable commodity. I don't care if it's personal life and work, whatever. That is by far, and not to get on a tangent, but time <laughs> is the only thing us as human beings should be worried about in everything yeah. we do. Because that's the only so, thing that doesn't go backwards and we don't get back. So when we can get that time in a spindle to make somebody's weekend with their family a little bit more enjoyable, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm, I'm going right at the yeah. heart, right? I'm, I'm trying to yeah. get them right at the heart. But, but, but it's true. That's, that's invaluable that, to me. I mean, that worry-free. So, you know, that's kind of what we're selling. Harvey Performance is a cutting tool company. I know it's definitely what I'm selling is the time. I'm not throwing tools yeah. at somebody saying, hey, here you go. This one, will, you know, it'll make a cut. They all will, you know. <laughs> what we're trying to do is, is get more repeatability, less quality uh, issues, less chatter, more parts going out yeah. the door, more machine time, and more your life back. Time is the big thing, like on all everything you touched on there, because what I'm hearing too is less uh, need for operator interactions, if it's just an operator at the machine versus a programmer or a setter machinist, yep. right? But also easier to program when you've got those reliable tools because you know you've got a strategy that's going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got all the boxes ticked. Yeah. So when you put that tool in there, you've got the time to let that machine run. Your operator's got time now, if, especially if they're operator level where they're tending to different machines, different tasks while that spindle's running. You know, you've got the longer uptime. So you're not changing tools all the time because mm -hmm. they've worked with someone to get all of those boxes ticked. You know, so it's kind of like when I come to the table, it's like I'm talking about, you know, the tool holding and cutting tools and the work holding, not because I want to sell those things, but because I want to make their time at work yeah. an easier day for Absolutely. them. Right. I when I was a machinist on the shop floor, I hated bringing my work home with me. But I'll tell you what, if I was snapping tools that day, if I had a part that moved that day, if I couldn't make the time and they were reviewing my job and I took 10% more hours than I was quoted for the labor, like that was the stuff I brought home. Yeah. And I don't want anyone I work with to have to bring their work home. I want them to go home, spend time with their family, you know, go to bed peacefully, wake up excited for work. I, it's getting a little grandiose. I don't want no, to keep I, going down I'm, that. I'm with you. But... And I know. I know we went down a rabbit hole, but I mean, it's really kind of what we're selling is time. Um, the good ones are, right? I, I say the good ones are, yeah. right? I mean, it's a big industry. <laughs> not so big. And I'm not, you know, pointing. I'm just saying the good ones are. If, yeah. if you're invested in trying to save your customer time, and then you're one of the good ones. And uh, there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of them out there. There are. And that's. You know, like our conversation today, I'm looking to have more conversations with other people out there that are the ones bringing value yep. so we can bring more awareness, man, because sure. the ones that care, it's obvious when you talk to them, when you when you whether you're watching a video like this, then you reach out and you have a conversation. You're like, oh, man, that's the same guy I just watched on the video. Like it's the yeah. same person. They just care a lot about manufacturing and that's what they're passionate about. Uh, and that's clear talking to yep. you, Don, all the time yeah, we've been interacting you. over the the last few years since I started with Thomas Skinner, you know, as the application engineer, you know, the, the problems you get pulled out to to solve for other people or the solutions you uh, bring that that's the whole reason we're doing this video today yep. is because we were both talking about it like, man, we're both really passionate about this. <laughs> We should do something together, yeah. right? Like, true, true. And, and this is more just a conversation with me and you just kind of walking through some of the issues and things we see. And, and it's yeah. like we said, I mean, I, I don't know how many times we can say it. It's just a combination, right? It's a combination yeah. of so many things. You know, a, a safe lock has three different numbers before yeah. it opens, right? It's kind of the same thing yeah. almost, you know, I know there's a bunch of analogies, but you know, you got to get all those combinations right before everything is humming and you can move on to another project. And so we're just a piece of that puzzle. You on the distribution side to make sure you're getting the right things sorted to that customer being the last line of defense for their application yeah. and us being a vendor that supports the distribution side and the end user. I mean, we're all just there as a tool to be used 
every year. I mean, Harvey, how many new items a year are you got at oh. Harvey Performance? Do you know the Harvey tool book? And I'm going to actually shoot a video. I'm actually probably this week shooting a video okay. of the new release of the new product for Harvey tool. But that book is almost over 30,000 SKUs in that book, all stock on the shelf. Crazy. 30,000 <laughs> items. Yeah. Items, solid round tools, all from 1,000 diameter all the way up. We got things, you know, two inches, three inch uh, slitting saws. So, I mean, the yeah. versatility of Harvey Tool as just one brand is just, it's crazy. So, there's a lot of things to, to, to look at when you're implementing these yeah. solutions. Yeah, well, and that's like yourself and myself at the distributor side. It's like when the customers bring us problems, it's like, okay, well, now we know, even if we don't know the direct product, sometimes you do. You're like, oh, yeah, this product, I've already solved this problem. But you know who even on your own team. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, it's it's it's, it's a composite. Okay, well, I, I've got someone that's better at composites than I am. I'm going to connect yep. you with them because they'll get you sorted, right? Yep. Oh, it's, it's, you know, aerospace and ink canal. Well then Don, you're probably the right guy to be talking to about that. Right. And we have teams around that. So even I'm the guy yeah. I have, I have more people that I can consult on our team to actually get those solutions and, and uh, solve the issues. Yeah. It's, it's having the right people in your pocket. I always, I always talk to my customers, you know, when it's hard to actually break into somebody, I'm always like, Hey, everybody has a person, right? You have your person, yeah. you have your go-to. I always say, what do I need to do? for you to be that person. What do I need exactly. to do to be the person that you go to for reliability and trust and every, and usually that's earned and we get there, but that's what I'm always looking at when I go to my customers is, okay, everybody has somebody that they rely on. Yeah. I wanna be one of those people. That's a good way to look at it. That's uh, how I approach when I first got off, cause I went from the shop floor right into mm -hmm. sales and. That switch is something else. But anyway, <laughs> but that was what I went. I was like, look, what are you struggling with? Yep. I will bring you a solution. If it works, I just want to be the guy you call when yep. you're working through something. Yep. But that's, I think, a great way to approach yep. it, Don. And a great thing to share with everyone out there. Yeah, <laughs> like... yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. But, uh, getting back into the uh, the side effects of some of the issues that happen with the tool, the next, the next thing we should probably jump to is the fixed stream, right? Holder. Uh, uh, yes. vices, uh, yeah, five axis, uh, hanging out tombstones, right? Um, yeah. rigidity of the table, rigidity of the tombstone. Am I at the top of the tombstone? Am I at the bottom of the tombstone? What's the rigidity there? Those are a lot of things that have to do with your chatter, with your taper, with your repeatability, with your chipping, all those type of things. So from the spindle, yeah. from the tool holding, from the machine tools, now we're looking at the actual fixturing of how are we holding that part you know how rigid is it is it overhanging the biggest thing i like to bring up when you're looking at fixturing is we do a lot of things with castings castings have weird yeah. shapes they're already close they're not very consistent they're held in different areas that has a lot to do with how that tool performs you know what's the vibration i can hold it here but i can't hold it here you know so this has got more of a springboard this is more rigid, uh, has more rigidity. So those type of things with the holders and the fixtures are another big key to making that actor, actress win the Emmy, right? <laughs> I'm calling my cutting tool, you know, the, the star yeah. of the show. Let's just say, right? The yeah. star of the show. So we just got to make sure we put it in a good movie or a good machine. So, so that's yeah. another factor uh, that we look at when we're getting chatter or not getting tool life with the tool is okay. How's it being held? What's the vibration? Is there overhang? Is it being supported? How rigid is that? Yeah. A lot of, a lot of key factors. Well, yeah, even uh, like you said, for the horizontals, what, where you are on the tombstone, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you've got a 10 pocket tombstone and you know, the bottom row is really good. The next row is pretty good. The top row though, chatter everywhere. Yeah. Do you need to just, change your values for the top? Do you need to look at making the tombstone more rigid? Do you need to look at putting it on a vertical on a pallet system instead? Yeah. Like depending on what you have for a machine availability, depending on what you have for process tweaking, there's a lot of different things to consider to get towards that cost efficient place, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can tweak enough variables to make any part on pretty much any machine. But if you're, you know, you're cutting super like a 718 in canal, 
on a hobbyist mill, you're probably not going to make any money doing it because yeah. you're just, yeah. you, you can't get the torque, you can't get the cutting pressure, you can't get anything else there. But I've even, talking about the tombstone example, I've even seen it on verticals where certain corners of the verticals table, for whatever reason, when they were interpolating over there, you know, maybe it's five, ten years old and the it hasn't been maintained the greatest, yeah. but when they interpolate a circle on one corner of the table, they get vibration and then they interpolate it on the other. Where and I? oh there's no issues. Yeah. So we just moved the fixture. Uh, I had one instance on a vertical and it was actually the machine was out of level. So when the table was over one direction, it weighed, it was perfectly on the pads. But when the machine went to the other side, one of the pads was just like a micro movement. It's not like you could see the machine yeah. dancing, but it was just enough. That and then they had to relevel the machine. They squared the machine all up, they trammed the head. And boom, no more no more vibration issues. Yeah. So it literally goes down to the foundation your machine is resting on sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. And this is where you have to bring up all these things. You have to look at them all, at least. Yeah. At least. And and this is also why it's great to get somebody's opinion. Some of these shops, which I had my own shop for eleven years, Arthur. Some of these shops kind of amaze me in the sense that they don't really want to bring in people. Right? They have this yeah thing and it's like i'm looking at it just from another set of eyes right you know bring in somebody yeah. let them look at my process a little bit as a vendor we, we do it for free <laughs> i'm just yeah, saying exactly yeah, we want listen <laughs> it, i'm not gonna stand here and say i do i'm not gonna say i don't want to sell you cutting tools that's my job yeah. i sell cutting tools i want you to use me but i want you to use me as a resource and therefore you're going to get a lot of my help and support of Harvey Performance with purchasing the cutting tools. And that's expertise in machining, programming. We have relationships with, with programmers, machine tool builders, you know, and stuff like that. So we don't only just bring in the cutting tool, we can do a full service kind of thing. And so those type of things, well, you know, I, 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 I sometimes question why some of these shops are like, no, we don't bring in we don't bring in vendors, you know, we don't bring in anybody yeah. from the outside. It's like not even to take a look at something, you know, I mean, I mean, and I get it in the sense that I have so much to do that I understand in some ways it probably helps me, right? <laughs> in some ways, <laughs> it's probably a good thing. So all those shops out there that don't want guys like me to come in, you're probably helping me right now because remember that time thing I was talking about? I don't have any more time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's fair and but it's it, i think it is a missed opportunity again like you said whatever the reason is i mean i am more than willing to sign an nda to go into a shop i am more than willing to hand over my phone and lock it up in the whatever they need to yep. do for their their security protocols i've got no issue around that i mean i personally treat any conversation like an nda unless i get permission to share something yep. like you and i are recording this so i've got your permission <laughs> full, full disclosure <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. We, you know, we keep talking, we keep touching on the edge of the skills gap and where guys like ourselves in the industry can help bring that experience into a shop. Yeah. You know, they might have a couple skilled guys, but those couple skilled guys are super tied up with internal projects. They don't have time to look at everything that's coming in the door. They don't have time to go do the research on new tools or do the research on new cutting methods or new programming methods because they're stretched thin internally, yeah. well, then then you can pull on Thomas Skinner as a distributor yes. or Harvey Performance as a cutting tool supplier yep. because we have networks that we've trained up to be reliable, to have knowledge of the newest techs and be aware of the newest programming methodologies and to be aware of the different ways to hold and the whole envelope of the things to consider yes. when you're looking to be profitable. And like you touched on, you've got a whole network, even in the aerospace side of things, you're like, oh, okay, well, I can go bounce this off a couple other guys. I haven't done this specific application or I haven't worked with this specific grade of titanium because yeah. there's so many different little mixes of titanium sure. out there now. Absolutely. It, it's really a, a missed opportunity to make your company more profitable. Yeah. When you're talking about the investing thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, if, if you don't invest in your own company, then you're really just shooting yourself in the foot, yeah. man. I, I, don't, I don't know about down there, but we've had even this year, a few manufacturers shut down. 
because they're just getting to that point where they haven't been profitable for so long and they've kind of used up their stuff and they're putting their equipment out to auction. Can't compete, yeah. Yeah. And no, that's sad. I hate that. That, yeah. that shop was someone's dream at one point yeah. and they had to give it up and they had to put it to auction. Yep. Like... Totally agree. So rely on your resources. Take advantage of them. Yeah. You know, take advantage of them. I mean, that's the biggest thing is is uh, at least once, right? You got to listen to everybody. I always thought about that when I had a shop. I mean, I would have a lot of people that would just walk in and I, the, the ones that don't make the appointments. And I would always yeah. give them the respect. I would come up from the shop because I would run my machines and be, do the programming. And I would walk up and I'd be like, yeah. okay, I give everybody one shot. You came in here. You got something to sell me. It's supposed to be great. Here's your shot. Let me know what it is. And then that'll <laughs> determine whether or not you come back, right? Yeah. And so... I appreciate it when I, I go into shops and they give me that opportunity to give my 15 seconds of what are you here for kind of thing. And, and, and how is this going to benefit me? You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and I think I do a fairly good job of trying to explain in those 15, 20 seconds of what I'm there for. And it's to give them time and to try and yeah. help them with their applications. And if they see it, then usually I get to the shop floor and if they don't, it's a polite thank you and, uh, you know, go, go get a sandwich, you know, or something, you know what yeah. I mean? But uh, knock on wood, I've had a pretty good success rate because in this industry, I try to be as sincere as possible. I don't want to waste anybody's time. That shop owner that walked from the back to give me that 30 seconds, that's already time that I'm taking away from them. So if I can't give them something in return, then I probably shouldn't be there. Yeah, that's something uh, Ross McDonald, he's our president now, but he was the sales manager when he hired me. And he told me when I started, he's like, look, he's like, the only thing I got to say is if you're going into that shop without something of value to bring them, mm -hmm. he's like, get back in your car and leave. Yep. He's like, don't you dare waste their time. Yep. 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 That's a good like, lesson. Okay. Well, that's, that, that's pretty clear. Yep. <laughs> it is. And then you, once you build up a reputation, I mean, with... You doing these, uh, you know, vlogs and I have some vlogs and stuff like that, which has helped me. It's, it's, it's uh, helped me immensely get into shops where they're like, hey, I watch, I watch that guy's videos. Yeah, come on in, you know, <laughs> which is which is great because you're trying to build credibility is what I'm trying to do with those videos and education. And so it does help. So anybody that's out there trying to do what we do, I would just say keep keep bringing the knowledge, build a reputation right and and the right yeah. reputation and you will be successful in this industry and we need more help yeah so come on in oh yeah you have to start right Absolutely. the first uh, the the first yeah. uh, avenue for progress is starting you have to yeah. you have to start so uh i've been fortunate in this industry i started when i was 18 years old and i've been doing it ever since yeah. so uh i i really enjoy it i enjoy my customers i enjoy talking to to, to people like yourself and uh, hey, listen, you know, we're available. We're available. Yeah, well, exactly. And I'm so grateful we had this conversation, Don. Yeah. Um, was there anything else we talked about the the tool holding? You know, it doesn't always have to be a uh, you know, shrink fit or a hydraulic chuck mm -hmm. or like the Rego Fix press fits uh, the power grip mm -hmm. system. Good it system. doesn't have to be high end, yep. but you've got to consider it. Yep. You've got to consider your programming, how you're going to remove the material, how you're going to hold the part, what machine are you putting it on? Mm -hmm. um, you know, horizontals, anything else like that. Absolutely. Is there anything else that uh, we can consider? Now, the biggest, the, the biggest takeaway I think from this whole conversation is to make sure when you have a $50 cutting tool or a $30 cutting tool or inserts, be that detective, right? And, and that's why we try to do these and train people. Take a look at different things. Make sure you're fixing the application and not just masking the problem. And that's the biggest thing. Now, to end this, if you're doing a prototype one-off, it is whatever you want to do. I'm the first one that's yeah. going to tell you if it's a one-off part, you want to use high speed, you want to drill it with a, a wood drill and aluminum, if you can get the job done, totally get it. I'm not going to come in there and try and reprocess. But if you're doing production and you want to compete with your neighbors and you want to compete with different countries, then you must 
look at every avenue to optimize, streamline, and get that program to run with the best options you can to compete and put dollars and time back in your pocket. That's a that's a great point to end on, Don. And especially for the one-off stuff, man, sometimes you just got to figure out if you can even reach all the angles on, you know, you just got to do that. I will say, you know, yes, there's production, but there is still a middle market that I like to talk to too. And that's look, if you're a jobbing shop, you can still break down your parts by operations. Yes. When I do cavity work, I use this. When I'm drilling and tapping, you can break it down by materials. You can break it down by operations. Mm -hmm. You can still standardize your workflow and dial it in because it, some guys just have, they get stuck. At, oh, well, I'm not an OEM. I don't have high volume. You know, I'm not doing 10,000 parts a month. No, you're not doing 10,000 parts a month. And you can still break down how you're doing these parts yeah. to be more efficient. And I still think that's worthwhile. I think that's a great point because multi-functioning tools, right? Drill mills, yeah. right? They're going to chamfer. Yep. They're going to drill. They're going to mill. You know, those type of things. Uh, thread mills, single yeah. form thread mills. Do 15 yeah. different pitches. You know what I'm saying? With one holder yeah. and your tool holder. Multi, multi-functioning tools are a big thing to save time, to save money too as well. 100%. Yeah. There's always a way to look at it. Well, thank you so much, Don, yes, for contributing it. your wisdom, joining this conversation, dude. I am so grateful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anytime. And, and you as well. I will mention Thomas Skinner and your facility is one of our great distributors up in Canada, and we appreciate everything that you, your team does for us to help support our product too as well. So thanks for that and uh, appreciate you having me. To everyone else out there watching, thank you. And until next time, keep your spindles turning and earning. Take care.